All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the seventh day of the third month of the 2023rd year in the Western calendar of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, yeah, we're we're actually just, you know, the West European Anglo, that stuff, is really just a small portion of the world. And it's only one particular calendar. Uh, it's important to remember that, or to remember to have a broad enough perspective that we don't get uh, all caught up in ourselves, uh, which is a problem for all of us. Um, you know, I happened to uh, do a YouTube search for pagan Christianity, and boy, do you get an eyeful. Uh, a man named Frank Viola wrote a book called Pagan Christianity, along with... Who is a pollster? Is a pollster, um, Christian pollster. Anyway, uh, the, the the actual content. The, the, but you see all these things called, and that book has been used. It says Christianity's all a fraud. It's all false. Da 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 da. It's all pagan. It's all its pagan origins. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Uh, the the uh, that book, and I've got a copy around someplace, I believe. What it actually talks about is how paganism leaked into the church. Uh, not necessarily deliberately brought in, but leaked into the church. Christians, <clears throat> uh, uh, either because they were naive uh, or simply uh, not converted, uh, brought in paganism because they liked it. And they thought it was good. They didn't see a problem with Aristotle and... Uh, and uh, Platonus and Socrates and Plato and all this stuff. Although these were, you know, you look in uh, uh, some theology books, and it's very clear that that uh, some theologians are so entranced with these pagans that they they are anxious to pronounce them as saved because they agree with their philosophy. It's like Aristotle. Aristotle's a pagan, not a Christian. Plato is a pagan. What do they have to do with Christians and Christ? Nothing. Nothing. Lost. Without Christ. They didn't have faith in Christ. There, there's no anonymous Christians, contrary to the primitive Baptists, <laughs> which are really weird. I don't know how they got so weird, but they did. Um, I'm an equal opportunity critic here, but uh, I want to uh, go back and talk some more about what I talked about uh, yesterday with Roman Catholicism. Um, let me find the right button here. And again, this is from the, the Remnant newsletter, conservative Catholic guy, bordering on... Um, the the rebel the rebellious conservative side in Roman Catholicism, uh, Roman Catholicism has always had all these factions, and uh, what holds Roman Catholicism uh, together is the papacy. Even now, the German uber liberal German bishops are in rebellion against the Pope. <laughs> so he's just losing. He's just losing it. Uh, but he's out of all the people that that don't pay attention to the Pope inside the church, the ones that he hates the most are the the young uh, conservative Latin mass mass uh, Christians that want to go back to the traditional Catholic liturgy and everything else. 
There's a certain logic to using Latin, having one language for the one church, even though that's not, it never was. See, that that's, uh, Roman Catholicism is ahistorical. I mean, it, it is a false history. It's just like what the, uh, the, the Ukrainians have done over in Ukraine, the neo-Nazi, they're not neo-Nazi, excuse me, the they they stem from uh, Stefan Bandera, who was a a a fascist, uh, the Nazi racist ideology, and the Americans in 2014. These people already existed, but the Americans empowered them. And what the the uh, the uh, what should we say the 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 all the the ultra nationalist element. That'd be a good way to describe it. Ukraine never had an independent existence. That's nonsense. Ukraine never existed for any historical period as an independent nation. That's nonsense. It, just look at the maps. You know, you, you just Google uh, world map or Eurasian map. Uh, 1900, 2000, uh, 1800, 1700. No, Ukraine was, no. Uh, the current Ukraine is sort of cobbled together from different pieces, but uh, the majority of what's called Ukraine for at least three centuries, actually longer than that, goes back uh, as part of the Russian Empire. But Russia really began, Christian Russia, a thousand years ago, with uh, Prince Vladimir uh, of the Kievan Rus, the Kievan Rus people from the area of Kiev, <laughs> the Russians from the area of Kiev. So don't believe the garbage you see on American media and the Internet, most of it, it's all trash. It is truly the... the uh, the United States is the kingdom of lies, and we know who the liar is. The more I think about it, the more it's obvious his his central throne is sitting right in Washington, D.C., or in Silicon Valley. I mean, that's the Western White House, which is what they call, you know, Richard Nixon had his Western White House. No, you probably don't know that, <laughs> because uh, <coughs> you're probably not as old as I am. Uh, but I, I want to look at this again because it's it, this is this is the most central thing. Uh, pagans aren't a threat to Christianity. False Christians and false Christianity is the biggest threat to Christianity, and they abound. So let's take a look at this article here a little bit uh, and this quote out of here, which is so revealing about what not what the pagan uh, Rome the, the paganism of Francis is because he's just an out and out pagan. He has nothing to do with Jesus Christ and he's an enemy of traditional Catholicism. Uh, he's just tearing it all down. Uh, he's he thinks Vatican II didn't go nearly far enough. but uh, at least traditional Catholicism, Biblical Christians knew where they stood because it was very clear. Rome said, you're going to hell. Uh, a Vatican too. they still say biblical Christians are going to hell, but Mormons, uh, Muslims, and uh, um, Hindus, they can all come in. Uh, they, they universalize Christ's salvation except for people that, uh, that deliberately reject Rome. Like me. <clears throat> See, Rome, uh, the faith in Rome in the Roman Catholic institution is what Roman Catholicism is all about. That's what my long, long experience and close experience with Roman Catholicism since my wife's family was Roman Catholic. And living down on the Mexican border for 10 years and uh, I'll tell you, world, uh, Roman Catholic Catholicism in Latin America is much more authentic than the Roman Catholicism in the United States. Uh, because in the United States it had competition, and it was a minority uh, originally, a very small minority originally, 
like confined to the colony of Maryland. Mary land. Uh, named after, of course, uh, the mother of Christ. <clears throat> it was a it was like a almost like a penal colony, exile for the Catholics of England. Because after they tried to blow up the English Parliament, there was a backlash. And uh, officially, the government said, "Well, you tried to blow us up. Uh, we need to suppress you." So they, the king at one point said, "Well, you don't like us here, so we have a place over in the, the colonies. You can go and cut down trees and make farms and stuff over there if you'd like." We won't bother you too much as long as you stay in Maryland. I believe there was actually a, um, like the other colonies, there was some particular individual who petitioned the king for that. So it wasn't like a James's idea or something. But uh, uh, so let's take a look at this. And by the way, that, you know, some of the so called bigotry uh, against the Irish was not simply because they were Irish, it's because they were Roman Catholics, and Roman Catholicism is a threat to, to biblical Christianity. And the popes of, of all the period up until very recently what were vociferously the enemy of American values, which I don't think much of either, but uh, condemned them outright. Um, which some of which is valid, because <laughs> America has no biblical values. It's, it's not. I mean, the the Constitution, contrary to what you probably been told, is not based on the Bible. It's basically the teachings of a an apostate British philosopher named uh, <clears throat> what was his name? Now, I just had it on my mind and it's gone. Uh, um, Locke, John Locke. Not, you know, it was the Enlightenment ideas. And that was what the Founding Fathers, you know, Jefferson and all these characters, Washington, they were all into that stuff. I don't believe that those people were, were Christians. It was just at that period, to be an atheist was unacceptable. So they were deists. They, they were like Masons, you know, have the generic, they acknowledge the existence of a generic creator god who then just the clockmaker he created everything wound it up and then went to do something else in other words he's not actively involved in creation which is also true about calvinism by the way if you really understand the god of calvinism a calvinist cannot believe in the god of the bible now all you calvinists out there i love you but you've been deceived the God of the Westminster Confession of Faith is not the biblical God. And that is why James Dozal, who is a Reformed Baptist, has detonated, destroyed, uh, atomized, uh, or at least divided, Reformed Baptists, which is an oddity in itself, because he's introduced uh, what's called on the Internet, at least classical Christian theism, which is paganism. The, the theism of Aristotle. And that's why James White has been labeled by at least a good portion of his fellow Reformed Baptists a heretic. A heretic. Because he doesn't accept the teaching of Thomas Aquinas. He, he claims to be a Biblicist. Not really, but he just doesn't embrace all the Bible. You can't as a Calvinist. There's too much in there that offends Calvinism. And closed theism. And by the way, they all, he's always against open theism. That's an issue of the nature of the future is what it's really about. But people like him don't understand that. He condemns others, and then he's in turn condemned. Uh, but yeah, it's a question about whether God decreed everything in exhaustive detail. That's closed Calvinism. A closed theism. That means uh, everything's been predetermined by God exhaustively, including all sin in exhaustive detail. 
And if you want to hold to that bunk, show me in the Bible where that's taught. It's not. It comes from paganism. Uh, it's derived from the, the absolute immutability of God, where God cannot see anything. God cannot learn. God cannot perceive. God is totally self-contained, and he's unaware of anything outside of himself. His knowledge of the world comes from his eternal decree. That's it. He's got no eyes. He's got no ears. He's got no mouth. He's the God of theology that can't do anything. If you simply look at it and think and aren't impressed by the smoke and mirrors of Calvinism, really the Calvinist theology is just Roman Catholicism through Augustine and Thomas Aquinas. See, it's not... It's not pro Calvinism, their theology of God, it does not come from the Bible. It comes from Roman Catholicism and through that, paganism. And that's getting back to uh, the book Pagan Christianity. That's what that book was about, all the paganism that's been brought into the church as opposed to New Testament Christianity. You know, the institutional church and the sacraments and... Um, Christmas trees, and even Christmas itself on the 25th of, of December. and None of this comes from the Bible, okay? Some of it may be pseudo-harmless traditions, but because it's outside the Bible, I'm not sure about how harmless it is. It has no authority. And it's, made, it, it's given ammunition to cults like Jehovah's Witnesses. Because they go around and say, see, this stuff is not in the Bible. See, Christianity is false. Well, real Christianity is what's in the Bible. And that's what you should follow, the Christ of the Bible. Okay, so here, the, the, the thing I really got, and, and I'm going to want to go into this in greater depth, is uh, conservative Catholics are at war with Francis uh, because he's a pagan truly a pagan, like a Mother Earth worshiping pagan, believing in some sort of cosmic Christ uh, after the mode of uh, Pierre uh, uh, T.R. de Chardin. Um, I don't know if the Pierre is there. T.R. de Chardin. Yeah, uh, T.R. de Chardin. De Chardin. That was the last name, I guess. Uh, a... a whose writing was a bit in vogue, but naughty, among Catholics at the time that Francis was in seminary. And eventually his writing was pretty much not... Uh, it was uh, put on the no-no list. Not on the absolute forbidden, but just don't use this material for instruction. And he was like an evolutionary... Uh, he was a... a, a let me put a little background here. Evolution, physical evolution, basically is a derivative of theological evolution, which is paganism, evolving upward toward God. Uh, karma, uh, Hinduism, reincarnation, all these things are aspects of that basic idea that we're progressing toward returning to God. Hinduism has, uh, well, it's sort of hard to talk about Hinduism, but basically there's an idea uh, in higher Hinduism, at least, uh, intellectual Hinduism, as opposed to popular Hinduism, with their 300 million deities, is that it's, God was one. He was the all, you know, sort of like the, the united force of, of Star Wars or something like that. Uh, and there's various terms. And this was in the West, too, in, in, in Greeks, in uh, Neoplatonism and uh, the various other cults that were around there that actually uh, sometimes tried to mix with Christianity. So there was this, always this fight in Christianity with the, with the false doctrines, trying to, people trying to bring it in. Uh, various groups that held to foreign ideas and tried to incorporate Christ into their pagan theology. Now, 
Where was I going with that? Oh, yeah. Uh, the, so the Hindus, they sort of at least some elements of Hinduism, high Hinduism, which has a sort of trinity, you know, that you have, uh, uh, oh, I can't remember the names of it, uh, Shiva and uh, the various, I think there's three, the destroyer, the sustainer, and the creator uh, aspects. But even in intellectual Hinduism, it's all one. The 300 million deities are all one. What happened was this original a uh, unitary deity that not, there was nothing other than this thing. This is the sort of the, uh, the the philosophical god of Aristotle could fit into this too. And something happened. It, the, the, this deity that everything was in harmony and there was a disruption in God. Uh, an anomaly occurred in God, in his mind or something. And he exploded uh, basically, God, God's being was shattered, and that brought about the manifestation, which is what they call creation. So it's simply everything is God, but God just sort of lost his mind and um, split apart, fragmented into different slivers and everything else. And the, the goal of cosmic evolution on a cosmic scale uh, and uh, D.R. de Chardin is well into this. This isn't a cult doctrine. Is to get God back together. And the goal is that that our in, in uh, Hinduism and Buddhism existence, our existence, is a problem for us. The goal is that everything will. It's sort of like the old. If, you, if you're familiar at all with the old theory of the the expanding and collapsing universe, there was the Big Bang, and eventually the Big Bang will return into the Great Crunch. And it'll just oscillate. Oscillating universe goes back and forth between the Big Bang and the Great Crunch. And uh, in a, in a the, uh, again, the, theo the theological uh, ideas of this preceded the, the physical science ideas, uh, where you had this explosion in God, the shattering of God, from his peaceful tranquility of total harmony into the manifestation that what we see all around us. And God's goal is to reintegrate himself, to get himself back together. And then every, that'll be the big crunch because we'll all be reabsorbed into, deity, into the deity and we shall be no more as individuals. That's not Christian at all. That's not biblical at all. There is a unity between us and God that occurs, and indeed, as Christians, has occurred in its initial stages, where we become one with God in Christ. But it is not a absorption. It is we do not lose wills. We do not cease to be individuals. But we simply return. We simply live in complete harmony with God and his purposes. It, like, think of cells in your body, you know, in a way. Um, and that's Christ's mission, is to, to bring humanity and creation, which was disrupted too, back into harmony with God. Now, what the what was cross was about. But in... in Deschardins, what he does is he has this idea of cosmic evolution where Christ didn't actually raise from the dead. He, he was reincarnated as creation itself. So uh, with Chardin, as far as I can tell, uh, and most of this comes from summaries because his writing is about as clear as mud. Uh, it's it's a occultism. It's you're better off just reading summaries. If somebody else has done the, the sweat and blood and tears to, to to dig into it, because otherwise it will give you a phenomenal headache, and it's dangerous. You might get ideas that you find very hard to get get a, get away from because they're attached to demonic entities, because um, that's where they come from. The perennial doctrine, as it's sometimes called, is demonic. That's why you find these same ideas occurring in the West, in the East, in, in, in Asia, in India, and among native tribes in North America and, and on regenerate centers. They just gravitate toward that stuff because there's a, 
Satan is the king, the god, small g, of the world. That's his domain. He's the one that orchestrates all the propaganda. And he generally, a lot of it is just to keep us confused. He plays good cop, bad cop all the time, you know, and starts wars. Why? Why does he start wars? And to distract us from the truth, the truth of Christ, keep our attention focused on everything but what God wants us to focus on, our real problem and his solution. So, uh, but Chardin, which I think... Uh, Francis wouldn't publicly say this, but there's there's indications, uh, uh, at least not so far, that he actually is sort of a disciple of Chardin or has adopted similar views, um, which explains the Amazonian Senate, uh, Synod, not Senate, Synod, and the Pachamamas and everything else, because it's all one. Christ is present in everything. That's a New Age. The New Age Christ is not the Christ of the Bible at all. So, uh, anyway, that was a rabbit trail. Sorry about that. But authentic Roman Catholicism, as it exists, or did exist prior to Vatican II, uh, Vatican II didn't really change it. They say that they accept, like, the the, the Council of Trent and all those dogmas and everything else, and they turn around and say the opposite. It's sort of like trying to make a deal with the United States, you know. Don't trust them. They lie. They never keep their words. And that's the history of, you know, look at what they did to the Native Americans. I mean, you, you couldn't trust the United States. You can't because they're all liars. It, and the longer you live, the more you know that. You see it. You've got your own history of, of seeing these things. But here's the quote. Now, see, this is the Thursday after Lent, Wednesday Colette, part of the, the liturgy, uh, Lenten liturgy for that particular day. As far as I understand, I don't have all the documentation, but I don't want to dig it up either. Uh, let me make sure I got on the screen what I'm seeing here. So this is... This is real, this is part of the liturgy for Lent, which is the 40 days prior to Easter, which is a bad name for Resurrection Sunday, but, or is it 50 days? No, 40. Is there a biblical basis for Lent? No, there isn't. No, there isn't. Does God tell us to observe Lent? No, he doesn't. And I'm going to show you why and how paganism was brought in. Uh, paganism is where you appease God through an offering, a gift. Make a deal with God. God, will you, will you be good to me if I do this for you? That's the opposite. You know, when Jesus talks about uh, unless you read, unless you come as a child, you shall in no way enter the kingdom of God. He meant with a, 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 a child that will just reach out. So you offer a child something, they don't ask you, what, I could, what must I do for this? Not when they're young. They just, oh, thank you. And that's what he meant. He wasn't talking about being childlike. He was just talking about simply trusting God, which is, which is the only interpretation that's in accordance with, with the general revelation of Scripture, going back to Abraham. Abraham believed God's promise, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. We're, we're righteous through faith in Christ. Not believing, not, uh, not faith in general, or faith in something God doesn't promise, but in particular, faith in God's promises in Christ. He that believes in me, shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Trust in him. I just believe that he existed. You know, I believe that, that, that uh, Abraham Lincoln probably existed. <laughs> but 
that doesn't make give me a, a relationship with him. I can't say I know Abraham Lincoln. I know about him, but that's the same thing. But it, it's uh, the same the same idea is, is knowing about Christ is not saving faith. It's having a a right rela relationship based on faith with him. He that believes in me, that's trusts in me. The idea you can't separate trust from intellectual belief. I mean, the intellectual belief is not what the Greek word pistis means. But here's the, the portion of the liturgy for Thursday after Ash Wednesday. Oh God, who by they, hey he's co corrected it yesterday and said why by sin today and somebody corrected it. O oh God, who by sin art offended, true, and by penance appeased, absolutely false. This is an antichrist gospel. Should say, and by the cross of Christ art appeased, by the death of Christ art appeased. No, it's our penance, our doing something to make up for our sins at least in part, to show her serious about it. No. This is condemned by the Scripture. This, is, this will take you to hell if you believe this. And this is part of the liturgy. O oh oh God, who by sin art offended, and by penance, our penance, our, our doing something to try to undo or make up for our are evil, are appeased. No, he's not appeased at all. Not by that, only by the blood of his son. Mercifully regard the prayers of thy suppliant people and turn aside the scourges of your anger, of thine anger, which we deserve for our sins. Because of our penance, our works. Penance is something you do. This is evil. This is absolute evil. This is anti-gospel. At least with Francis, you know it's nonsense. You know, when somebody brings a Pachamama into the Vatican, or into the, not just in the Vatican, into St. Peter's, and says, behold thy God, kind of thing. It's like, no. But this is, is much more subtle. Satan's subtle. He slips poison into your drink, and that's what this is. It, it sounds good to our flesh. It sounds reasonable to our flesh. This is, nat this is the natural religion of fallen humanity. God's got a problem with me. God, what can I do to make it up? Let's make a deal. How much do I have to do for you to, to, to appease your anger? And that just makes God more angry. <laughs> because you're not believing in Christ. You've rejected his salvation, and you're substituting your salvation, your penance. And it goes on. May our fasts, fasts, you know, giving up food, uh, giving up chocolate for Lent, do, doing this or giving up. See, you're supposed to give up something for Lent, right? Put those ashes on your forehead to show you're a, 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 pen, a penitent sinner, not a repentant sinner, which is changing your mind about your own right. See, uh, repentance, first of all, is, is, is repenting of the idea that you're, not a sinner, and that you're okay with God, and that you can do something to appease God even if he's not okay with you. You've got to repent of your own works, your own religion, your own self-righteousness. That's a big barrier. That'll keep you from salvation, the sin of self-righteousness, the sin of penance. Repent of your penance. Repent of your fasts. May our fasts, again, things we do, to satisfy God's anger, supposedly, 
Be acceptable to thee, O Lord. We beseech thee. Oh, man, if I was God, this would make me so angry. Almost as angry as Fat Tuesday, Mardi Gras, which is the, the, the day before Lent starts. You know, So we're going to spend 40 days afflicting our souls and, and fasting and doing penance. But the day before, we're going to sin a lot. We're going to go out and get drunk, be gluttons, and maybe engage in some heavy fornication. Because it's the last chance we'll have for 40 days. Oh, yeah, that really shows God you're... you're... Yeah. Uh, how would God... How do you think God looks at things like that? Why do you listen to these priests? There's no separate priesthood in the Bible. May our fast be acceptable to thee, O Lord, we beseech thee. And by expiating our sins, to expiation is, means to take away, or to take the punishment away at least. It's not propitiation. It's, it's, less, it's less than that. It just means that it removes the problem. Expiate our sins. No, your fast and your penance can never expiate your sins. Otherwise, Christ wouldn't have had to die on the cross. So when Jesus said, Father, if there be some other way, take this cup from me, there was no other way. But if, if you're going to engage in, in doing penance for your sins and fasting for your sins and doing all these works to to expiate your sins, you're saying Christ didn't do it. Well, then Christ wouldn't have had to die because you could just expiate your sins without him and without the cross. And Christ didn't come short of doing it, that he needs a little bit from you. It's not just Roman Catholics that do this either. This is the general idea prevalent among what's generally called Protestants. If you, you'll hear it come out of their mouth now and then too. But the, the idea, I think it's just natural in sinful humanity to try to make a deal with God. God, can I, can I, can I somehow do something to get you off my back? <sighs> and what, what, what do those people do? They end up turning to people like Kenneth Copeland or Pope Francis or, or John Piper or some other heretic. And Piper is a heretic. Piper is through and through works. He's finally come out and admitted it openly. No, Piper doesn't. Piper believes in the Roman Catholic doctrine. You start by grace, but then you've got to work the rest of your way to heaven, which is also has um, not too long ago there was a big push and corruption entering into uh, certain elements of Calvinism, where there was people coming in uh, teaching uh, final salvation, just like Piper by works, not by grace, by works. It's something in fallen humanity that just wants to work. Our works, not Christ's works. They don't like that. It's like, I think it's our pride uh, because we don't want to feel that we're so bad and so irredeemable. There's nothing we can do to solve our problem takes us out of the picture. It's Christ. All we can do is believe him. That's it. Which isn't a work, because uh, Paul contrasts it with works. So th this is, this is uh, real Catholicism. It is, a, it is a system of... I think the best way to try to understand it would be God subsidizing our works. 
Uh, Christ isn't enough to pay all the penalty. He doesn't, God doesn't do enough to, to totally pay the penalty for your sins. He leaves you with enough payment to make to make sure that you understand it's still serious. Now, I'll pay 90% of it, but you got to pay 10% or you're not going to get it. It's a deal. You know, it's like, okay, I'll give you salvation on a sale, but it's not going to be free. I'll just pay some of the cost. A subsidy. Because you can't pay it all, so I'll pay some, and you got to pay the rest. That's Roman Catholicism. But it's not just Roman Catholicism. It's an epidemic among humanity. Humanity just, this is not what the Bible teaches at all. So let's go over to what the Bible teaches. And how vigorously this is condemned by the scriptures. Okay, do I want to start there? No, that's not where I want to start. I want to start with Galatians. As I told a certain Nazarene pastor, every pastor should read this book twice a year. I don't think he took my instructions to heart. I haven't heard back from that, man. I told him quite plainly that if you don't have Christ's righteousness imputed to you, you don't have a gospel. See, it's what Christ did that saves us, not what we do. And I sort of got the idea. I, I never heard about Christ and the cross at the church there. And I kept hearing about, oh, we got to do this, and we got to do this. And, and their whole, you look in the Nazarene handbook and you get a book of rules. It's not about Christ. It's about what we have to do, our holiness, how holy we have to be, and personal interchange with Nazarenes, too. Oh, it's a sin to drink a beer. My, my response was, the Bible doesn't say that. Being a drunkard is sinful. Jesus created, like, what is it, 60 or 80 gallons of good intoxicating wine. <sighs> you know what it says? And you know, so when the, the, the steward talks about, well, why, are you, why did you do this? Why did you serve the, the, the junk wine first and then save the best for last? Nobody does that. You serve the best first, and then when men have become drunk, well, well drunk, you know, uh, intoxicated, then you serve the junk because they don't really care anymore. They don't, you know, it's like, oh, it's, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 wine in the Bible is not, uh, is, is often praised and at times condemned. You know, the, the overuse of it is certainly condemned. But uh, it's also spoken highly of in the Proverbs. It's, how, it's interesting how selective people can be when it comes to quoting the Bible. But uh, here, let's get back to Galatians here. Paul, an apostle. Now, this this letter starts very unusual for Paul. He doesn't. All the other letters, he tends to praise the churches he's writing to. An apostle, not from men or from man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. So he starts by asserting his authority. I'm sent from God and all the brethren who are with me, to the churches of Galatia. This is a region in Asia Minor, in the general area of what is now called Turkey. That would be like the eastern area, I believe, of Turkey. Uh, <coughs> Turkey, Syria, kind of more in the Asia Minor is that, that area, though. Or at least what he's writing, Galatia. Grace to you. And peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins. Okay, he gets right to the point here. The grace has to do with what he did. That he might deliver us from this present evil age. And look out the window. Boy, is it evil. And growing in evil. According to the will of our God and Father, Jesus Christ gave himself. John 3, 16. 
for God, referring particularly to the Father there, but to the Trinity as a whole, but they're not of, of divided minds. So loved the world. This is more than just meant cosmos. It, it's, it's God's, what would he say in colloquial English? God's bling. Uh, it's, it's the word cosmos is the word that means adornment. A creation is God's adornment. Man was created to be God's adornment. Re the revelation of God, God adorning, making himself visible. He's, he's, he's known through what he has created, in part, because creation's been affected negatively, too. But uh, uh, specifically, you know, Jesus said, He that has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus himself is the very image of God, completely. Uh, and, and that's what we are predestined to be as Christians, conform to the image of Christ, that he might be the firstborn of many brethren. When Christ returns, we will be resurrected or transformed, one or the other, instantly into the image of Christ. So we will be in, uh, uh, as in harmony with the Father as Christ has always been. Which means you can say to this mountain, be moved and cast into the sea, and it'll obey you, because it'll be God's will that you do it. You'll know it. It's not our authority, it's God's authority, but acting together with God, co-laborers with God, to accomplish his will in creation to be his manifestation, visible sign, uh, presence in creation. His dwelling place, which is what the church is supposed to be, what church is, the real church is. Uh, currently it's invisible, because and Christ is invisible, currently. You can't see him with your natural eyes. Currently, that'll change soon. To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I marvel. Now he gets, I'm, I'm amazed. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. See, Roman Catholicism is a different gospel. The prosperity gospel is a different gospel. Any gospel that is not the gospel of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, is a different gospel. John Piper preaches a different gospel. Uh, Rick Warren preaches a different gospel. Sometimes it's not obviously different, but it is. Piper spent many years concealing his false gospel, his gospel of faith plus works. But his gospel is really the same as Rome. You start by faith alone, and then you progress to, then from that platform, as he puts it, you then build your works, build your way to God. No, you cannot enter the kingdom of God by and. Stay in the kingdom of God, according to Piper, by faith alone. He denies faith alone. Why hasn't he been thoroughly excommunicated and verbally burned at the stake? He should have been. Verbally burned. Renounced. Exposed. By more than people like me. Where are all the shepherds that are supposed to be watching over God's sheep? Making their own deal, I think. They're hirelings. They wouldn't lay down their lives for the sheep, most of them. They're professionals. Would they do it without pay? Hmm?
back on track here. Which is not another, because there is no other. There is not two Gospels. There's not ten Gospels. There's only one. And that's the one that's revealed clearly in Scripture. Especially by the Apostle Paul, because he's the one that spends so much time on it. He's the one apparently chosen by God to basically explain it. You know. We don't really need the theology books. They're a hindrance. But there are some who trouble you and who want to pervert, to twist the gospel of Christ. Why would they do that? Well, what would happen if, say, well, if we if we do this, we can inject ourselves between Christ and uh, the salvation and the people, and then take a cut off. Oh, you got to have the priesthood. You got to have us. You got to have the sacraments. You got to have the institutional church. For outside the institution, there is no salvation. That's an absolute lie. Outside of Christ, there is no salvation. They're liars. They have Bibles. They just don't believe them. And when they tell you that Rome never changes, they have records, Catholic books, that show how Rome's changed. Like Denziger's, the sources of Catholic dogma. Catholic book endorsed as a Catholic and doctrinally sound book that gives you the dates and the people who changed the doctrine. They just ignore it. They ignore the truth. That makes them guilty. They have it in front of them, just like most people in the Bible. They don't read it. That condemns them. They don't, or if they read it, they don't believe it. That condemns them. They've heard the truth and they reject it. <sighs> now, Paul, see, does something he doesn't do anywhere else. But even if we, Paul and the apostles, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed, anathema. That means delivered up to God to dis for destruction. Or perhaps in modern English you, you would say, let him go to hell, because hell is destruction. I mean, it's God's dump. What you do with all the people who refuse to be saved. They're, they they got to be confined someplace. You can't let them running around ruining heaven and creation as they already have. Why do we put people in prison? It's what hell's for, too. It's not just punishments, it's confinement to keep them from doing harm to others. As we have said before, just now, so I say again, let me repeat myself, you follow saying, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, when they were saved, let him be accursed, or when you believed, I should say, let him be accursed, anathema, that's a command, by the way. Let him be accursed is actually a command. That means basically asking God to destroy him or her. Turning them over to God to be destroyed, to God's judgment. He doesn't say ask God to forgive them, ask God to grant them repentance. He said no. Ask God to, commands you to ask God to destroy them what the word means. Turn them over to God's judgment for destruction, his wrath. 
Why? Because these people are enemies of Christ, seeking to pervert God's salvation and keep people from being saved. That's what is happening when you turn from the true gospel, believe a false gospel like what Rome preaches. Yes, superficially, it's like the like Christianity. It has some of the externals of Christianity. It has the cross of Christianity. It has uh, the Lord's Supper. It has baptism. But they've all been distorted. And the salvation of God has been taken away from you, the, the person that's in the church or believing in Christ, and given to the institution that claim and then you have to go to the institution for salvation and do what they say and give them money. By the way, they still sell masses. They still give indulgences, usually for sale. They trust in the institution of what calls itself the one holy and apostolic church, rather, and its sacraments, and its priests, and bishops, and pope, rather than trusting in Christ himself and what he accomplished. They put themselves in between God and the sinner, Christ and the sinner, God's salvation and the sinner, interposed themselves and interfered with God's salvation in order that they could benefit, could, could basically act as a middleman and take a cut. And they make them, and this is what's happening in Galatia too, these people were, were corrupting the gospel in order that uh, the, the Judaizers were saying, you have to be circumcised. They were telling the Gentiles, you have to come to us so we can teach you the law and circumcise you in order that you can receive God's grace in Christ. They weren't denying Christ. They were just adding Moses to Christ. Um, oh, uh, Calvinists do that too. Law, is, according to them, is of grace, just like Christ is. They're just two different administrations of one covenant of grace. Don't listen to them. They don't know what they're talking about. They don't know Christ. They have they'd rather believe men and pagans in, in, than, than Christ. They don't believe the Bible. They twist the Bible to fit their theology, as so many others do, too. It's not a Calvinist problem. It's... A human problem. Verse 10. For do I now persuade man or God? Or do I seek to please man? For if I still pleased man, if I'm still seeking to please man, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. In other words, if I'm a servant of Christ, I'm not seeking to please men. I don't work for them. I seek to please the one that's my master, the one that I owe everything to. I'm not looking for a paycheck from you. There was a time among Baptists where the idea of a professional ministry, a paid pastor, was an anthema. If you're not doing it out of the love of God, we don't want you. In other words, they, they had their own farm or own business. I mean, how, how much... You know, a pastor's not a full-time job. If he makes it into a full-time job, he's doing something wrong. First of all, it's supposed to be elders, plural. So it's not a terrible burden on one person. Elders and deacons. What do they do? They just sort of oversee things to make sure everything goes right. They don't do all the work. If the pastor is the one always doing the work, well, then it is a distortion. He is not doing A pastor actually is not, it's, these aren't offices anyway. They're 
there are people that, that you know, people, everybody who's a Christian has been given, a real Christian, has been given a spiritual gift by God. And it's just a manifestation of that gift. Well, it's not anything special. Just that they just have sort of like make sure everything does works well. It's like a foreman. Uh, when everything is working well, the foreman is redundant. He doesn't he doesn't do the work. He doesn't do the work. He just makes sure everybody does their job and has what they need to do their job. He himself doesn't do any work. He's just a helper. That's what a, an elder and a, a, a deacon are supposed to be. <laughs> They're not more than anybody else. But they some of them want to be. Oh, yeah. They want glory for themselves. Well, they probably won't get it. So what's the deal here? But I did not make known to you, brethren. I, I didn't come to you try to tickle your ears and take advantage of you like Joe Osteen and, and Kenneth Copeland and a myriad of others do. A myriad of myriads of others. I wasn't a ear tickler trying to, to for my, uh, deceive you for my own benefit. But the gospel I preached to you was not according to man, for I did not receive it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Christ. I can say the same thing. I have been sort of taught some things about the Bible. <laughs> Went through confirmation, all that stuff, but I didn't know Christ. I didn't understand in my heart that Jesus died for my sins. That took a revelation of God. And suddenly everything changed. My relationship with God changed. Didn't make me perfect. Not yet. Not yet. I'm waiting for that. Uh, this old body is on borrowed time, or limited time, not borrowed yet. <laughs> but I'm getting to that point. 70 to 80 years is sort of like, you know, your expiration date. Uh, sometimes like, uh, canned food goes well beyond the expiration date, but doesn't get better with time. <laughs> but that, this is this is not my eternal state here. This is a temporary dwelling place. And I'm reminded more and more how temporary it is. <sighs> I've been trying to do a little repair work on it recently. Got to last a little longer until Christ comes. Probably. He's got to come soon. This world is, in, I mean, there, there, this world will destroy itself. Already we've seen the danger that we got madmen in charge, particularly in the United States and Europe. And they're already talking about using nukes. They're the ones talking about nukes. The Russians, they know that nukes aren't practical. The only thing they're good for is is threatening the other side. If you shoot shoot your nukes at us, we're going to make sure that ours get back to you. Mutual assured destruction. That's what that is. But they have no practical use. Not if other people have them too. You know, you drop them on Japan and nobody else has them, then you can get away with it. And that hasn't really worked out well for the United States either. Uh, the, the, the infamy of having used those two nuclear weapons is, uh, you know, a stain. One of many. Because the United States is not exceptional. The United States is a nation of sinners, just like every other nation. I use nation loosely. Nations are defined by God, not by man. Then he goes on to talk about how he advanced in Judaism and persecuted the church and yada, yada. Um, but and, and how, but how his, the gospel that God had given him was, was 
from God, not from man. He didn't learn it from the apostles. It was revealed to him by God, by Christ himself, the road to Damascus. Jesus sort of interrupted his journey to persecute more Christians. So let's go on to chapter 2 here. So he talks about, continued on the, uh, here in chapter 2, talks about the, 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 church, the council meeting in Jerusalem and says that we presented, took it there to present it to the church, and the church in Jerusalem, the apostles and the church, and the decision was the Gentiles don't have to keep the law. They don't have to be circumcised. It's not part of the gospel. It's not part of salvation. In fact, he uh, it started when uh, Peter had come to where he was, and when some Jewish believers from the uh, uh, from James. Uh, came and apparently uh, Pharisees, uh, they hadn't uh, had this revelation of the gospel. And they thought the law and the gospel, just like uh, Calvinism, uh, were really together. And they said, you know, and Peter was afraid to, to stand up and then Paul rebuked Peter. And I said to Peter before them all, if you, being a Jew, live in the manner of Gentiles and not as Jews, in other words, Peter wasn't keeping the law, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? So Peter separated himself from eating with the Gentiles when the Jewish Pharisaical Christian believers showed up because he didn't want to be sent. You know, like, so say, put it this way. So so Peter was there at the table drinking a, drinking a beer because we're a beer drinking people, nor in the wine. Uh, uh, having a pork sandwich or something, you know. Or just eating with Gentiles. That was forbidden. And then the, these uh, uh, Christian Pharisees of the of the sect, you know, that had been, were part of that sect, but had come to faith in Christ. Pharisees in the biblical sense, not in the American English vocabulary. The holiness people. <laughs> that was sort of what the Pharisees were. They were serious about the law. They were serious about revelation. They were serious about inserting their own rules, too. <sighs> the holiness people. Yeah, there you go. Uh, that's the, the modern equivalent. Uh, I mean, very much so. Uh, including John Wesley. Knowing that uh, say, we who are Jews by nature are not sinners of the Gentiles. So he's talking about, hey, Paul was a Jew of Jews. He was zealous for the law. Not like the Gentiles who were ignorant of it. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, by obedience to commandments. But by faith in Jesus Christ, even we, Peter, you and I, have both believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no, fle no flesh shall be justified. You see, the law is a dead end, literally a dead end. Your own works. It's any kind of law. There's generally not a definite article before the word law here in the Greek. So it's 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 by rules, by keeping rules. If and if keeping God's rules won't do it, then certainly keeping man's rules won't either. No flesh will be justified by law, by obedience. This was also a big challenge that was ongoing about by the Auburn Avenue of theology, otherwise known as, what was it? Uh, uh, well, Doug Wilson. 
uh, was into that and is into that, uh, who is a familiar with uh, James White. And through James White, they're bringing their theonomy and this other garbage into uh, Southern Baptist uh, through uh, the uh, Reformed Baptist group that has now exploded over James White. What do you mean you don't follow Thomas Aquinas? You heretic! You heretic! Blame James Dozal. He started the whole nonsense, really. Or brought it into popularity. Yikes, what a mess. What a mess about garbage. Fighting about man's garbage. Scraps. They're like the, the poor in some countries digging through the garbage heaps to find food or things they can sell. Scavengers. But if we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are, but if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are found to be sinners, is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Certainly not. For if I build again those things that I have destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. In other words, if you turn back to the law, having found the grace of Christ, you're rebuilding what you rejected. You can't have the law and have Christ. Because the law doesn't bring salvation, it brings condemnation. For I, through the law, died to the law. The wages of sin is death. That's in the law. I died to the law that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. His death is my death. In him I have died. I have paid the penalty of the law, therefore the law has no more authority over me. The law has no authority over the dead. And it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave his life for me. I don't have to do penance. Christ paid the, the entire punishment. He paid my bill. Not only that... <sighs> I've died to the world. I've died to the, well, he's talking about the authority of the law. I've died to the, under. I'm no longer under the authority of the law. I'm in Christ, and he's risen from the dead. I do not set aside the grace of God. If you're doing penance, you set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through the law, Christ died in vain. If there was another way, Christ didn't have to die. Remember his prayer? Three times, yes, Father, if there be another way. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. There was not another way. Salvation was only possible that way, contrary to Calvinist. They're, 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 you've got they, their idea of God is God could have done whatever he wanted any way he wanted. No. <laughs> not really. Not according to the Scriptures. Oh, they'll not like that remark. Oh, foolish Galatians. Foolish Galatians. Who has bewitched you? Puts you under a spell that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. Paul had come preaching Christ, Christ crucified and Christ risen from the dead. Our salvation. That was his gospel. We're saved by faith, not of works. As he makes clear in basically everything he writes. This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by the hearing of faith? See, in Paul's writings, the presence of the Spirit in your life is, is the evidence, the proof that you've been saved. Not an assurance, a feeling of assurance, not an abstract faith, not a system of doctrine, not belonging to an organization or an uh, institution not having participated in sacraments. No, the fact that the Holy Spirit is in you, and you're expected to know that. 
apparently. He said, examine yourself. Don't you recognize that the Spirit of it is in you unless you fail the test? And he makes it very clear that if, if a man does not have the Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of God, he doesn't belong to Christ. That's one of the promises of the New Covenant, God's Spirit indwelling you. Have you suffered so many things in vain? If indeed it was in vain. Have, uh, therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law, out of your obedience, or by the hearing of faith? When God does a miracle, when Jesus did miracles, let's just think of public examples that we all know about, did he do it because of obedience, that this person was endeavoring to keep the law, or because they simply trusted him? Just like Abraham. Was Abraham accounted righteous because he was a man of obedience to God or because he believed God? And believing God in, in, entails trusting in what God has promised. It's not, it's not an intellectual faith. It is a, a trusting faith. The word faith and trust can't be separated, especially in the Greek. It's a, you can't you can really have, it's not faith in a thing, it's faith in a person. Trusting the person of Christ, the person of God. Not some dead thing. Not some God who does not see and hear and cannot act or have a real relationship with people. The God of Calvinism is like that, by the way. The real God of Calvinism. The God of the Westminster Confession of Faith and the Second London Baptist Confession. is that kind of a god. It's a pagan god. It's the god of Aristotle. Just, just compare them yourself. You don't have to take my word for it. You know, people say, oh, no, it's not. But go compare what Aristotle's hypothetical god was, what he, he said about uh, what god would have to be like, and then go to what is called classical Christian theism or present in the Westminster Confession of Faith. This is also Catholic, by the way. Catholic, I mean, it came from, from Augustine and everything else. It didn't, wasn't invented by Calvin or the writers of uh, the Westminster Divines. It was invented by them. It was part of the paganism that had entered into the church over the centuries especially with the so-called conversion of Constantine. You know, the church wasn't nearly so bad as long as it was being persecuted. But once it became favored by the emperor, then people had all kinds of reasons to join it other than salvation, other than because they believed it was the truth. And that's continued on for centuries in America. People like George Washington, for example, or Thomas Jefferson at times, and the others that are manifestly not Christians by their own writings and actions, deists, but it was a social necessity if you were looking to advance, say, in politics or in the military or something like that, to be a member of the church, which was a state church, the Anglican church. Now, if you were a independent, well, then there was no social benefit attached to that. Just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, verse 6. Therefore know that only those who are of faith are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying the good news. So let's just remember, the good news to Abraham. Because the word gospel means good news 
So it's not the gospel in its entirety. It's the good news God preached to Abraham that in you, all the nations shall be blessed. The gospel is set into all the world. The good news of salvation in Christ is sent forth, you know, the, the, uh, by the uh, instruction of Christ, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to all nations. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. For as many... Now, it's also understand, uh, important to understand that Abraham was the one to whom God gave circumcision. After he had believed and was accounted righteous, as a sign that, that uh, uh, just, he was justified through faith, not, because, not through circumcision, through faith. That was a reminder to him of how he, he was accounted righteous, that he believed God. And to us all his descendants also. A reminder that salvation is by faith, by trust in God. And they turned it into what? Salvation by circumcision. By sacrament, rather than salvation by faith. The sacraments are reminders of what God's done, or confessions of what God's done, a declaration of what God's done. They are not salvific. They are not the means of grace. They're the testimony of grace. <sighs> People get everything upside down and backwards. For it is written, for as many as are under the works of the law, are under, again, the word under the law, the is not there, it's under law. As many as under the works of law are under the curse. For it is, uh, now the, the law goes back to uh, the Garden of Eden, too. Don't, uh, he that eats of that tree shall die. The law of sin and death is that. Uh, sin brings death. Disobey and die. Well, Christ took that out of the way. Having satisfied the, the penalty of the law, God is free to give grace. Otherwise, he couldn't. And be just. God has to satisfy himself. Not us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things that are written in the book of the law to do them. All things. Now he's talking to Peter here too, so keep that in mind. No, he's not. He's talking to the Galatians here. Excuse me. Uh, but no one is justified by the law in the sight of God. That no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Again, that's the uh, that's also occurs in Romans, and it's also what, uh, and perhaps got Martin Luther born again. Just as proof is born again Christians don't necessarily walk in perfect and consistent and logical faith. Uh, Luther was a man more of passion than, which is good. <laughs> I don't want to be. To pick too much on Luther. Given his circumstances, I don't think I would have done as well. But he did make errors, and they're not hard to see. The, but the error was not in believing that the just shall live by faith. You can see what uh, um, Luther did right, and you can also see what Luther did wrong. Because Luther wasn't Jesus Christ, and neither am I. And I'm not terribly concerned about that anymore. I, I, you know, I've come to the point that I'm not terribly concerned about my obedience to God. Because it's not what our relationship is based on. He knows what I am, and he knows I live in a body, a body of sinful flesh that often manifests itself. In fact, the visible appearance is a manifestation of sinful flesh, isn't it? So uh, I'm not, but because I know what Christ has done for me, by his very testimony from the beginning to me personally, apart from the, the, the church or whatever, that... Uh, no, I'm right with God because of what Christ did, not because of what I do. Thank God for that. 
and that's good. I don't have to worry about that. I don't have to, to try to figure out how, how I can please God or how I can glorify God. I have to do this. Uh, God, if, if he wants me to do something, that's in his hands, and he, he's arranged it before, beforehand. And, and he'll see it come to pass, and it's all to the glory of Christ because it's his work, not mine. And I don't have to. It doesn't depend on me. The world doesn't depend on me either. I'm, I'm not Atlas. I don't have to carry the world. Um, unlike people like John Wesley and that that thought, you know, the salvation of the lost depended on what they did. No, it depends on what Christ does. He's the one that sends out people to preach the gospel. And once in a while, I have the privilege to do that, like now. And I do a very poor job of it, but it doesn't really corrupt the gospel as long as I'm pointing you to Christ and him alone. <sighs> Yet the law is not of faith. Just shall live by faith, but the law is not of faith. But the man who does them shall live by them. In other words, obedience. Obedience is not the same thing as faith. And sometimes those get conflated. I myself have committed that sin of conflating obedience and faith. It sort of goes like this. If you truly believe God, then you will obey him. That's not the way the sin works, though. <laughs> Let me tell you that just because you because something's logical doesn't mean that's what will happen. That's what should happen. That doesn't mean it will happen in the life of a born-again Christian. Just because it should have, it doesn't mean it, or we think it should have, it doesn't mean it will. Living by faith is trusting God to, that he'll do what he wants. He'll bring it to pass in your life. That he will glorify himself. Not that God is really seeking to glorify himself in the way people think of it. It's really making himself known through us or in us and to us. Uh, see, see, the law is not of faith. But the man who does them shall live by them. Only one man did the law, and that was Christ. Which is, if he hadn't, if Jesus had sinned, if Jesus had broken the law, he could not save you. He could not save you. He could not be your atonement. He could not be a sacrifice for your sin if he was not spotless. Some people out there are being convinced by liars and deceivers and their own logic. But of course Christ said. No, he didn't. And if you think he did, you are mistaken. If you think the Bible says he did, you don't understand the scriptures. You're listening to deceivers. Somebody's whispering lies in your ear. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. What is the curse of the law? The wages of sin is death. Die, sin and die. Having become a curse for us. Now, he, he took the curse upon himself. He died for us in our place because of our sins, not his. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. That is written right in the law. And it was a stumbling block to the Jews because they, how can Christ be the Savior when the law says he's cursed because he was hung on a tree, on a cross of wood? But they understand, having become a curse for us, as is written, cursed everyone, everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessings of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith, the new covenant. That, that God's Spirit would dwell in us is one of the central promises of the new covenant that Christ came to bring into force. His blood is the blood of that covenant. Think of communion. This cup of wine, uh, of Passover wine, is the new covenant in my blood, he said. And the new covenant was the promise of God that he would bring something that was better than the law. And you'll find it 
principally in Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 36 and Jeremiah chapter 31. But I don't want to get into that right now. Then he talks about you can't, uh, it's not an addendum to the law. He goes on and on about that. It keeps, you know, talking about this. And basically it's like, wait a minute, it, it, it's a, don't turn, you've turned aside from the grace of God. Uh, here, the, the particular issue was, see, the, the, the Pharisees that were had come to Christ hadn't weren't straight on this on that it's it's not the law plus christ which is a sect in the united states that arose called the uh what do they call themselves uh, the new judaizers no that's not what they the uh gentiles who were trying to be jews uh, i can't think of the, what they call themselves um, those things periodically arise it wasn't too many years ago and not too far from where I am. Uh, oh, the, the name will come to me <laughs> after I'm done with this video. That would be a rabbit trail. Thank you, Lord, <laughs> for keeping me off that rabbit trail. So, the, the of course, the, they were teaching. Remember the, the issue at uh, the, the Synod, the first... Uh, church conference was do the gentiles half the pharisee pharisaical sect among the christians were teaching that the gentiles when they came to christ had to be circumcised and then taught to keep the law see they did not really understand what christ was about he was just a additive uh, an addendum to the law it wasn't really a a new and true way to salvation because the law could never save you never anybody that's read it i should know that so paul says again they said that they, they need to be circumcised and keep the law keep the commandments in addition to believing in christ indeed i Paul say to you that if you become circumcised, chapter 5, verse 2, Christ will profit you nothing. Faith in Christ will do you no good if you add circumcision. Why? Because you're not trusting in Christ alone. You're trusting in the law and Christ. But by the law, shall no flesh be justified. The law condemns you. So you're saying Christ isn't enough. And that's what the Pharisees were saying. Uh, the, the Christian Pharisees were saying Christ isn't enough. They didn't really understand what the gospel was. I testify again. He's repeating himself again, just like as he did in, in the first chapter of this letter, in the final chapter here, to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor, he's under obligation, to keep the whole law, all 613 commandments. See, you can't, nobody can keep the law today. You have to go to the temple three times a year and offer sacrifices. The temple doesn't exist. Why do you think God tore it down? One of the reasons God tore it down was to make it impossible. To make it impossible to try to, to come to a, a saving relationship with God through the law. It was obsolete. So God knocked it down because it became an idol. Okay, you don't want to uh, repent of Moses and believe in Christ? Well, I'll just knock your temple down so Moses can't help you. See, Jews... For almost 2,000 years, it's been impossible for them to keep the law. Did you know that? They don't keep the law. They know they can't keep the law. That's why some of them want to rebuild the temple. It won't do them any good. I don't think God will let it be rebuilt. 
Why? It would be an abomination. It, it'll, it'll be, see, the law can't save you. It would be a, an enemy. It'd have to be Antichrist that built the temple because that would be an abomination. That would be a nullification of Jesus as the Savior. Moses didn't save anybody. Moses couldn't save himself. Remember? He was barred from the promised land because of his disobedience. You have become estranged, separated. Like a husband and wife that are estranged, they're separated from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. Well, there goes eternal security out the window right there. Yes, if you separate from yourself from, if you cease to believe in Christ, to trust in him, you, you have cut yourself off. Because the just shall live, present tense, by faith. It's not a one-time instant of faith. It is a life of faith. It's not hard to do. All you got to do is trust God. That's what Faith is not something you do. You trust God or not? Do you trust what Christ did for you or not? And if you no longer trust that, you're no longer a Christian. You're no longer in Christ. You're in Christ by faith. You live by faith. It's like if you stop breathing air, do you continue? No, you don't. If you stop uh, trusting in Christ and what he, and his work, do you continue? No, you don't. You die. Spiritually dead. Estranged from Christ. You have fallen from grace. Don't believe these false teachers that talk about eternal security. All oh, one instant of faith is enough to secure you forever. That is, their transactional uh salvation. No, it's a personal relationship with Christ, with God through Christ. And you enter it by faith and you stay in it by faith. It's not just natural faith, it's God-given faith too. Otherwise you wouldn't stay in it. For we through the Spirit eagerly wait, and the Spirit is in us, and he keeps us. Wait for the hope of righteousness. The hope of righteousness. Not the, in other words, being conformed to the image of Christ is what he's talking about. By faith. He's not talking about imputed righteousness. He's talking about the hope of being fully conformed to the image of Christ and full harmony, living eternally in complete harmony with God. as the image of God. As the children of God. The full manifestation of that. That's the hope he's talking about there. Not the hope of a righteousness, imputed righteousness that we may someday receive. No, we already have that. If you believe in him, if you trust in him. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision again, these are commandments under the law, avails anything, or we could say baptism or unbaptism. We're not saved by water baptism. The Spirit isn't in you because of water baptism. It is You receive the Spirit through faith. It's faith, faith, faith. Water baptism can be a sign of, of, of that, but most people that are baptized aren't born again, so it doesn't really avail much today. Uh, not that you shouldn't be baptized if if you're committed. It's publicly committing yourself to Christ, publicly identifying with his people. It's for our benefit, not for our salvation. It's sort of like a marker, though. He said, I, I committed myself, and I publicly did it. And, you know, it's not like, oh, did I or didn't I? Well, you know, if you were sprinkled as a baby, that's that's why infant baptism is not baptism. I mean, that's not biblical baptism. I'm sorry, it's not. But baptism is, see, this is a difference between Church of Christ. This is why the churches, the proponents of, 
This is why the Campbells of the Campbellites, let's make, make it clear here, this is a little more descriptive language, were kicked out of the Baptists in America because for the Campbellites, for, uh, for Alexander Campbell and his father, baptism was salvific. It was, uh, well, as salvific as anything for a rationalist can be. And they were rationalists and former Calvinists. So it was conformity to the externals of New Testament Christianity. And that's what they are today. That's what they are today, and that alone. Uh, it is intellectualism. It is uh, the the appearance. The, you know, what name is on the church? It has to be Church of Christ or Christian Church or something like that. Uh, it can't be, uh, you know, like Lutheran Church or you know. that. That's an external. They know nothing of regeneration. They are as dead as stones. Generally speaking, there's exceptions. There's always exceptions, but generally speaking, to walk into a Church of Christ is to walk into a dead mausoleum. You're more apt to find born again believers among Roman Catholics than among Church of Christ. I have to say that. Now I think there are some. I just haven't seen one in a long time. There are there are people there are people that are very religious and devout, just like uh, Paul testifies of the Pharisees that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge, and that's definitely true of Church of Christ. Again, they're semi-independent. They're like Southern Baptists, theoretically independent, but not really. They have a convention too, by the way. Uh, well. Actually, there's several different kinds of churches of Christ. So, But yeah, they tend to all say the same thing. They're Campbellites. It was a father, Alexander's father. I think it was Joseph Campbell. I might be wrong. But Alexander Campbell was the, the prime mover. There were many elements to the American Restoration Movement, but including Joseph Smith, who clung on to it and peeled off a lot of Campbellites to Alexander's displeasure. A lot of the leading uh, Campbell uh, followers of Joseph, uh, Alexander Campbell left his movement to join Joseph Smith. Talk about out of the frying pan and into the fire. Yikes, there's an example of that. For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision. The externals, see again, circumcision was simply a reminder that salvation was by faith in God, not by anything else. See how it was corrupted. Baptism was corrupted the same way. Avails anything but faith working through love. Faith working through love. You ran well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion does not come from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens a whole lump. And he goes on for the rest of the chapter. Okay. Where I wanted to go. Oh. We don't have that there. I must have taken that window down. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Back to this. Again, this, this article, it's so clear that salvation in this is, in Catholicism, is a combination of faith and works. They don't say it's by works alone, no. But they absolutely hear so clear that, uh, by, that making a statement that thou art by sin offended, okay, and by penance 
appeased. Again, penance, if you don't know, is not repentance. Penance is a false translation in the Latin Vulgate, by the way, a translational issue. Uh, and people like Augustine, uh, that basically only spoke Latin, well, they were deceived by their translation and their selves. It wasn't the Spirit of God that deceived them. Penance does not appease God. It angers God because it is failure to follow God's way of faith in Christ and that alone. Nor do our fasts appeal. Every once in a while, especially in the charismatic community and others, fasting will become the, the uh, saving sacrament of the month. These winds of doctrine, they always bring error. They always focus on something other than Christ. Daily communion among Protestants. Yeah. I, I remember, I've seen so much of this stuff go on over the years. None of it is of God. The so-called revivals, I don't believe, are of God either because they, they don't really focus on Christ. They focus on other things. It demonstrates, if it's not Christ and his gospel, it's not a revival. It's a false revival designed to turn you away from faith in Christ. Pentecostalism is a false system. It's not about Christ and the cross. Oh, Christ and the cross are left in there, but they are minimized. That's not what it's all about. You can look at everything and see the same thing. It's like Roman Catholicism. It's the institutional church and its sacraments that are central. And exalts Mary over the Lord Jesus, too, commonly. That demonstrates that it is not of God. If it's of God, it'll preach the biblical gospel. Salvation through grace, the grace of God alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. His works, not ours. His suffering for our sin, rather than our doing penance for our sin. Have I made myself clear yet? I don't know. We seem to have heads made out of stone that just can't get that message in so often. And so easily, like the Galatians, we are persuaded by people not sent by God of other things. And our faith suffers. Our relationship with God suffers. Or we're cut off if we turn away and add, which is add to the gospel, which is saying to God that Christ and the cross was not 